My mother's bedtime stories were either war-related, where everybody dies at the end, uh, or stories that would make Stephen King freak out. And, I mean, she's telling me this one story about this soldier who went into an empty church, and he was not a good soldier, he was a Nazi, and he then committed a bunch of atrocities, and was in his church alone, and was praying, and suddenly the floor of the church opened, and uh, the devil came, took his soul, tortured him, and <laughs> brought him down to the, the base uh, the basement of hell, the floor closed and it was it. Then she said, Good night. And she, <laughs> and she said, Light, you know, like really? That happened? <laughs> and uh, and my father was the reverse. My father worked as a butcher in what is now called the meat packing district, but that was actually the meat market if you're if you're old as old as I am. And at two thirty, three o'clock in the morning he would walk they would start work around three, three thirty, he would walk to fourteenth and tenth. And it was like uh, some mornings I would wake up. He would. He, I, I am an insomniac because of my father. I, have not, I don't sleep a lot. It was because if I didn't go with him for that walk from 50th to 14th, he would wake me up at about 20 to 3 and say, keep an eye on things and leave. Mm -hmm. And I never knew what he meant because we lived in a really safe neighborhood. Nothing happened in Hell's Kitchen because it was run by the Irish or the Italian mob and they kept the lid on things. And so I would stay up and read or... We'd, uh, if the television wasn't in the pawn shop, we would watch TV. And, uh, but when I'd walk with him, if you go down, there was a whole other city and it was lit up and all the guys who worked there were uh, as luggers and, and meat packers. We're all ex-cons who had done time, like my dad. And, and they called it college. I kept thinking, you know, these guys all went to college you know, and you end up with this kind of job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I actually for a lot of years never wanted to go to college because I figured you know, I can get a job, just call my father. Um, but he didn't know how to read so after work and his hours coincided with mine, he'd come home around 3, 3.15 when classes and when school ended and he would bring home, uh, in those days there were a lot of newspapers, he would bring home every newspaper but the New York Times. I don't know what he had against the New York Times, but he just he brought the news, the Post, uh, what was it, the Herald Tribune, sure. the Journal America, and to this day I read back to f backwards because he always wanted me to start with the sports section, and he would lay down, and I I would read to him, and after a while, you know, he'd said, okay, read the sports. I would read crime and politics only if it was sleazy, um, or somebody kills somebody, that kind of stuff. Um, so then just to, uh, you know, if you read the same stories in five different papers, it does get a little tedious after a while. But I said, you know, Dad, we can try these guys with their pictures, you know, kind of the columnist. And I started reading Pete Hamill uh, when I was about 14 or 15. And the old, uh, this was within the old New York Post, Dorothy Schiff's Post, if you remember. It wasn't the, uh, Word on whatever it is today. Uh, it had Breslin, it had Hamill, it had... Uh, Jose Torres, I think Nora Ephron may have had a column in there. Um, so those people, and it, but Hamill for early on struck a note with me and I read up on him as far, he was a high school dropout, Pete. Uh, Jimmy Breslin, rumor has it took six years to get through high school. So I thought, and, and Pete wrote with such anger and he was from a neighborhood similar, he always had this great quote that he didn't come from a dysfunctional family, he came from a dysfunctional neighborhood. and. So I read and read and read a lot of him to my father, and, and my father kind of liked him. Um, so I wrote Pete a very long, long letter. Um, you know, the kind of stupid letter a 15, 16 year old kid writes on a yellow legal pad and mailed it to him. And a couple of weeks later, he called, and which I was really impressed because we had an unlisted number. Uh, and. Uh, he said, come down to the post, and I remember I went down there, it was on South Street, the old post, and he had a huge box of books on his desk, and he said, before you learn how to write, you're going to learn how to read, and he gave me a bunch of books to read, and, um, and then four or five years later, actually, um, well, I'll jump ahead, I ended up working at the Daily News as a copy boy, and the great thrill I had, copy boy job completely sucks. I can say sucks, right? Uh, I mean, it, it is the worst job. It's the pits. So I gave myself nine months to get promoted or quit. And the same week I got hired as a copy boy, Breslin and Hamill got hired as columnists at the Daily News. And uh, three months later, they both needed a copy boy. 
and I had already had enough of three months. Here's some of the things you do as a copy boy. And I, one thing I never understood, they give you four boxes of unsharpened pencils. They send you into a small little closet that has a pencil sharpener in it. They lock you in that closet. <laughs> and you sharpen the pencil. And I never understood why they needed, do you remember this, right? Why they needed to lock the door. And it was because of a guy, a previous copy boy, who was actually very smart. He would bring in a, a paper bag and four boxes of already sharpened pencils. <laughs> and he would go in there and basically read for about 20 minutes and bang and say, I'm done. Uh, Caroline Kennedy was a copy girl when I was there, and I had the privilege of showing her how to sort mail, um, which was, you know, the high end, because they would not give her, um, she actually had a body double. They hired a poor kid. <laughs> They had one of the copy girls, Mary Beth something, I forget her last name, looked just like Caroline from the back. So when Caroline, because the paparazzi were all over the front of the paper, whenever she had to go for lunch, <laughs> Mary Beth's one job was to put a hoodie over her head and run out of the front of the Daily News and say, leave me alone, I want to live my own life. <laughs> and, and Caroline would go out the back and go eat at Costello's. <laughs> Uh, and then Mary Beth had a, I think, had a time it, so she came back. But um, anyway, when I was 14 or 15, I had a notion, again, we didn't know anybody. I mean, when, if you tell people in the neighborhood I wanted to work at the Daily News, they, they would think you wanted to get a job driving the truck, because that was a union job and they could make that phone call. Um, I didn't want to drive a truck, I actually wanted to be in that paper, but I didn't know how to get into that paper. So when my father asked me what I was thinking of doing, I, you know, when I said the word writer to him, I didn't think of books or scripts or anything. I was thinking newspaper, you know, work here. I don't know doing what here, but somehow getting in here. Um, and he thought about it. He said, All right, you know, I like the paper, whatever. And uh, so one night, my mom and dad are watching the Murray Griffin show, and sitting as a guest was Truman Capote. And my father's watching, and he's identified as a writer. So my father's like, uh oh. So he said, you want to be like this guy? And I had no idea who Truman Capote was. I said, I, I don't know who that is. He said, well, they say he's a writer. Find out tomorrow what this guy did. So there was two choices. I went to the library. I could get breakfast at Tiffany's. Didn't seem like Dad's kind of book. And then this one with this great title that Dad would eat up like a, you know, like soup in cold blood. I said, this is it. <laughs> so I bring it home. I said, Dad, this is the guy. And my father said, he wrote in cold blood. So was it a murder thing? I said, I, I assume so, yes. Based on the title, I'm guessing. <laughs> and he said, all right. So I started reading and halfway through, my father, uh, he would lay down uh, with heating pads. I mean, he was all messed up from the butcher stuff. Um, he said, okay, if you can do this crap, <laughs> I'll back you up. He said, you could write in cold blood. I said, well, this guy already wrote in cold blood. <laughs> so uh, it was not easy getting into the Daily News. Um, so after high school, uh, I went to Mount St. Michael um, in the Bronx. We moved out of Hell's Kitchen when I, when I went to high school. I was thinking of going to college, and my father saw me in the kitchen looking at colleges. Uh, I wanted to go to Boston College. So my dad said, are you thinking of going to college? I said, yeah, pretty much. He said, put this into your thinking. We have no money. <laughs> I said, okay, so I have to come up with a game plan. He said, you know what a good game plan is? Get a job. And um, a friend of mine said, you know, if you get the right kind of jobs, you can end up going to college for free. And so I got a job at Manufacturers Hanover Trust, a bank that no longer exists in the check reconcilement department, and I still to this day have no idea what check reconcilement means, but they paid me 95 a week. That job was important to me for two reasons. One, 95 a week was a lot to me back, this was like in 72 or so. But I was sitting next to people who were supporting families, you know, maybe they were making a little bit more than I was, you know, 110, 115, whatever, based on experience, but they were going home to Queens and they had a wife and kids, and. 
you know, I was on my own supporting my father's gambling habits. Um, I'm paying the Con Ed bill. Like my, my mother, I'd get my paycheck and bring it home. My mother would say, this is for this, this is for this, this is for this. And then at the end, you give you $5. And I said, what's this for? She said, to get to work. And that's all I had. So, but, you know, you put table money on the table. That's what we're taught. And so, but Manny Hanny, the second good thing about it is they pay for all your business classes. So I took business courses. And once I filled that out, I now had to get into the Daily News. I was going to St. John's, which was the only school that fit my schedule. It's not that I really wanted to go to St. John's, but it fit my work schedule. And uh, once I filled out all the business requirements, I applied to the Daily I applied to every paper in the country. I saved about 200 rejection letters. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I applied to the New York Daily News, and I got back a rejection letter from a guy named Ed Quinn. And a young lady who was in my class at St. John's also applied as a copy girl, and she got hired. She's now an editor in San Francisco, Franny, Fran D'Amelio. So I called her, and I said, Fran, listen, I'm happy for you, but I'm just curious. What, how come you got it and I didn't? I said, she said, you need somebody. You need somebody on the paper who works there to sign your application. <clears throat> I said, well, I don't know anybody. She said, well, you know what? The school paper had two, uh, the school had two film critics who taught at St. John's. One was with Q Magazine, William Wolfe, and the other was Kathleen Carroll, who was the film critic down at the New York Daily News. Franny was the editor of the school paper. So Franny said, I'll assign you to interview, but you got to interview Wolfe, too. You can't just interview Kathleen. I said, well, I don't give a shit about the Wolfe. <laughs> and she said, well, you got to get to do both. So I went to do William Wolfe first. He was a nice guy. I barely, I didn't even take notes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I said, yeah, that's great. You can see movies for free. I get it. And um, you know, I didn't read Q. I, didn't do, I was the worst reporter. I mean, I, all I cared about was I had to get to Kathleen. So I get to the Daily News. Now I'm actually in the in this Daily News features department, and Kathleen was very nice, giggled a lot. Giggled all through the interview. I, I truthfully didn't understand a word she said. But I, had, I got an extra copy of the application. And at the end, she said the magic thing. She said, listen, you were a very nice young man. If there's ever anything I can do for you. I said, well, actually, there is. I took out, I said, would you mind signing this and recommend it? She goes, oh, it wouldn't do any good. I said, it wouldn't do any harm. So she signed it. I mailed it in uh, or dropped it off one or the other. I forgot. Anyway, a week later, the same guy who had turned me down, Ed Quinn, asked me to come in to see him at the Daily News. And I called Franny and said, listen, uh, Ed Quinn calls this. She said, unless you throw up on his desk, you have the job. Don't screw up. So I go see Mr. Quinn, who eventually later on promoted me many times. And he said, um, you know, he asked me a bunch of questions. I went to St. John's. The editor of the paper went to Fordham. He said, why didn't you go to Fordham? I, didn't tell, I couldn't tell him, you know, I was going on the arm. I was going for free. Um, I did ask if the news paid for courses. He said, if it helps make you a reporter, we will pay. I said, oh, yes. <laughs> um, then he turned it over and he said, ah, oh, Kathleen. I said, yeah. He said, how long have you known her? <laughs> and he knew it was complete bullshit. And he said, I'm going to take a chance with you. Uh, I'm going to hire you. And he hired me. Then I was getting up. He said, would you like to make $8 more a week? And I went, yeah, I guess. He said, work nights. And I did that for two and a half months, but then I realized if you work nights, it sucks because no one at nights can promote you. The only people who can promote you work days. Uh, so I finagled my way to days. And then I had to get in when Breslin and Hamill, and I, I got to know both of them, uh, they wanted me to be their copy boy. But the Daily News is, was a union shop. I guess it isn't anymore. So there were three people ahead of me. So I went to see old man Milty, who was the head of copy boys. I said, Milty, I need to get the Hamill Breslin copy boy job. He said, kid, it was up to me, he got it. But there's three bozos ahead. I said, unless you want to kill them, you know. I said, can I work out the, he said, you can work out whatever you want. So I went to see one guy, he said, can you work three Saturdays for me? He said, yeah, I'll work for three Saturdays. So he dropped out, another guy dropped out. One guy I got drunk and got drunk with at Costello's. He got drunk, I was staying sober. And he finally he said, you know, I really hate those guys. They said, well, why do you want to work for them? He said, don't treat. And then Breslin and Hamill got in on it, and they treated that guy like dirt. They were really nice guys, but they treated him horribly for like a week. They yelled at him, the coffee's too cold, the coffee's too hot. Um, so he said he passed, so I got the job with them. And 
and they basically tell me, they took me to school basically, and you know, I would write uh, so many different articles. I wrote for anybody. I mean, Jimmy's advice to me was very simple. This is typical JB. Write for, he said, you need to show people you can write. So write for anybody. Don't ever ask about the money, ever, until you make it. But when you make it, don't send out a Christmas card for less than $10,000. <laughs> so, and, um, and Pete, you know, and everything I wrote, I would put on Jimmy's desk and Pete's desk. And for, I mean, I don't know why he did it, and I love him for doing it. Pete would spend hours with me. I mean, going through it line by line by line as to why I would do this and why, it, you know, don't end sentences like that and, and, and like on a jazz. And I remember him talking about jazz. He was big and he loved music. He said, your, your article should read like a jazz musician ends a riff. He never ends it soft. He ends it hard, like blah, 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 blah. Breslin, I hadn't heard anything. So I figured, all right, he's ignoring it. So Jimmy didn't drive, so I had to drive. He never had a driver's license. Promised his mother he would never learn to drive. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we're in the elevator, and he likes a cigar because he knew that would piss people off. And, and we're getting out of the elevator, and he stops me, and he said, You're ending your sentences with ING words. ING words are weak. You got to end them with ED words. ED words are strong. End strong. And he walked away, and I remember the glow over the Daily News. I actually shouted, This fat bastard I actually read them. <laughs> and um, I said, Jimmy, this is amazing, and uh, and he helped me in one other respect. There was a paper back then called the Soho Weekly News, which was a competitor of the Village Voice. A uh, drunken old editor, he was a great editor, uh, Pete had got me the, the gig, five dollars an article, but I could write whatever I wanted. He called me and he said, this was during the summer of Son of Sam, when the city was like really in it, and Jimmy was at the heart of it, with the letters written to Bre Breslin from the serial killer. The editor's name was Al Ellenberg. He called me and said, I'll give you $7 for the article <laughs> if, you get a, if you get Breslin to let you follow. Jimmy would go to the Lover's Lanes in Queens to, you know, he was determined to get this guy. If you let Breslin, uh, if Breslin lets you follow him and you write a story, I'll make it the cover story, you get seven bucks. So I go over to JB and I ask him, he said, no, no, no I'm, I'm alone, I go alone, I go alone. So I knew his sons, he had twin sons, and I was talking to one of them, I said, you know, your father's being a real ass about this, I'm gonna just cover him, and he said, uh, tell me, you got a car, right? I said, yeah, just tell me to drive in the Queens. I said, really? He said, yeah, he said, you know, he'll take a ride from anybody. <laughs> so I go back into the office, and I'm sitting there, and I say, JB, it's too bad. He said, no, to that solo piece. He goes, hey, why is that? I said, yeah, I would have driven you to Queens. He goes, what kind of car you got? I said, I said what different is it? It drives, it gets in. It was a piece of shit for it. And I said, all right, let's go pick up lunch, uh, a sandwich, because we're going to park. And it was a diner restaurant, right across the street from the news. It was open all the time. And he said, you're a treat. I said, all right, what do you want? And he ordered a sandwich to this day. I've never seen any other human being off order. He asked for liverwurst and red onion on a hard roll with mayonnaise. And I went, you are gonna go in my car, dude. <laughs> I said, seriously, that's what you want? I said, and a Sanka. <laughs> he said, you want, me, you want to do the article or not? I said, yes, I'll do the article. And he's got this horrible smelling sandwich. Anyway, we parked in the lover's lane, and that first night I'm thinking, you know what, what if this guy shows up and shoots us both of <laughs> I'm Jimmy Breslin, it's gonna be Jimmy Breslin and some other guy. <laughs> and, um, uh, but you know, the story, I got a cover story in the Soho uh, Weekly News uh, for uh, $7. And, um, you know, eventually I just kept making, I wrote for everybody, I wrote a lot of stories for the paper. Uh, and they, I was at, at a time they had some terrific editors. To give an example, David Hershey, who's now the head of, I believe, nonfiction at HarperCollins, was an editor there. Uh, Carol Wallace, who became the editor of People Magazine. Uh, Susan Tepfer, who was a great editor and, and became uh, my wife. Um, and uh, so many other really good guys. John Quinn. Jack Sanders, uh, who liked having the young guys around, and Jack Sanders had done the reverse. He was a no very successful novelist early in his life, and then went to Newsweek, and then went to the Daily News. Uh, so he was the first guy to start talking novels. 
uh, Pete didn't think I was there yet. I mean, I, I knew going in, because my, there are gaps in my education that are frightening. I mean, I know things that a lot of you may not know because of the way I was brought up. I'll know gangsters' names or, uh, you know, how, to, uh, how a Monty set up works, how a scam works, but, you know, I never read Proust. Uh, but, uh, so, so you got to use what you got to use. So Jimmy, uh, Pete said, "Listen, it's going to be a long, long trip for you." So I, but you know what? I was content. I would, I would have been happy at either. I was really happy writing articles for the Daily News. At that point, they had a two million daily circulation, two and a half million on Sunday, and I knew the people who bought that paper. They were my people. They were Italian guys, Irish guys, working class people, uh, and I wasn't writing for, for you know the. The, the New York Times. I mean, to give you an example, we make fun of the, the guys in the paper uh, would make fun of the New York Times because they had long headlines. With, uh, there was a singer one night who dropped dead on a stage of the Metropolitan Opera singing. And the New York Times headline was so and so famous opera singer dies tragically at age 68. Daily News headline was Med Singer Chokes on High C. <laughs> 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 and, uh, so those were those were. I mean, they didn't beat the guy. To, you know, they had a contest between the News and the Post, whoever wrote the best headlines. And then Vinny, uh, the the Italian kid at the Post, won it with the headless body and topless bar. And, you know, which that was it. Everybody quit after that. Um, so anyway, I knew it would it would be a long journey. I didn't know where the journey would go, but if it meant to me my way of thinking, if it meant being at the Daily News for 40 years and writing and and getting published there, and that's all it would be, I was fine with that. If going to Time Inc. and working for 20 odd years, whatever, uh, writing for magazines, the different Time Inc. magazines, I would have been okay with that. Uh, unfortunately, when I got to Time Inc., uh, I worked for a magazine called TV Cable Week, which uh, I was told would never fold. And I left because uh, my wife and I were both at the news and we just had our first child, and every Friday, the Daily News sent out a letter saying, we may fold by Monday. <laughs> so we would, remember we used to pack our box, you know, we'd have to pack our desk every Friday. Finally, Ed Faye, Ed Faye said, listen, can I ask you, somebody asked, like after six weeks of doing this shit, said, excuse me, if let's say you do fold on Monday, we can come in and take our stuff. I mean, this is ridiculous, we move every weekend. Uh, it was a great place, it was a great place to grow up, but it was, you know, I left when I was 26, 27. It, you don't want to stay forever. I would have been happy to stay forever, but I would have not uh, grown as well. But they did pay for every course in college, except for one. Earth science was a big battle for me at the news. Uh, it was a $475 class, and I needed earth science to graduate. And Ed Quinn bounced it. I went into Ed Quinn, and I said, you bounced earth science. He said, well, it's not going to help make you a reporter. I said, well, yes, it is. <laughs> and he said, you don't even know what earth science is. <laughs> I said, I'm pretty sure it has something to do with the study of the earth, yes. <laughs> so he thought about it. He said, look, you've been hustling a bit. I tell you what, 50%. I'll eat 50%, but it stays in this room. I said, yeah, I know, but I'm still on a hook for about. He said, would you get out? <laughs> I said, seriously, you're not going to pay for this? And I was so pissed at Ertz. I remember I went up to that professor. I said, "I better learn something, something <laughs> in this class." And uh, he wrote a letter to Ed Quinn saying uh, that the stuff I was picking up, the knowledge, not stuff, the knowledge I was picking up in his class would help make me a reporter. And Quinn said that letter. You know what that what letter is worth to me? I said, "What? Nothing." <laughs> so college cost me, I think, two hundred and forty-five dollars. Anyway, I went to TV Cable Week. That folded after nine months, then started this sad, for me anyway, uh, my years in the wilderness. I became a freelance writer, which I hated. I really hated it. And, um, and I would bounce around and Time Inc. would call. I went to work for a magazine there called Picture Week. I did eight months there, and then I did um, a year with a startup magazine called Entertainment Tonight magazine. So I would get these jobs on what they call magazine launches. Uh, Dave Hershey said I was on more, and every magazine failed. Uh, Dave Hershey said I was on more launches than a NASA astronaut. <laughs> uh, and then uh, this uh, Jonathan reference, I knew this ex-cop, he was the cop, one of the cops who broke the French Connection. And I knew him from way back to when I was a kid. And he always said, one day I'm going to be a big time producer and I'm going to give you a job. I said, yeah, right. Uh, that'll happen. 
but one day he became a big time producer and one day he called and he said, listen, these idiots at Tribune are giving me a shitload of money to do a talk. They want me to do a talk show and guess what, they want me to host it. Hmm. I said, great. And he said, it's syndicated, I don't know what that means. I said, all right. And I said, what are you telling me? He said, I want you to work on it. I want you to put it together. Now Sonny, the way Sonny works is if he's hired you, that's it, it's a done deal. So he doesn't feel the need to tell everyone else that you've been hired. So I remember the Tribune people came in, and I later became friends with the head of Tribune, Peter Marino. In, in front of Sonny, he laid out the 10 reasons, because I had never done television, they were putting a lot of money into this. The 10 reasons why I should not be hired. By the fifth reason, I was agreeing with Peter Marino. <laughs> I said, yeah, right, I've never done that, I've never done this. And Sonny always eats during these meetings. He was eating spaghetti with clam sauce while Peter's laying out the 10 reasons. And, and wiping at his mouth. And so finally, Peter finished. And Sonny said, you done? And he goes, yes. He goes, I respect your opinion enormously. It means I do not respect you at all. And he said, listen, you came to me to do this show. Is that right? And Peter went, yes. I went to him to do this show. So he don't do it, I don't do it, nobody does it. So Peter said, it's a big mistake. And he stormed out. So I said to Sonny, I said, you know, I don't know what to say. So he goes, I know what to say. I said, look, don't screw up. <laughs> I said, I'm on the land now, Fee. I'm on this limb here. I said, all right. I got hired, and there was a guy named, uh, I won't use his last name, but, <laughs> you know, you, you get in with Grasso Jacobson, and it really is Italian-Irish cops. That's all they are. They, they pretend they're producers, but they're all Italian-Irish <laughs> cops. I mean, everybody on the show but me had a gun. <laughs> and we take the producer who's nicknamed for some reason, they call him from day one, No Eat Pete. Uh, we get this big meeting, and it's like we're there for like eight, nine hours breaking down a talk show. And Sonny always likes to, like I said, he likes to go to Rayo's, Mandicati's. He likes food. He likes. So he says, Pete, how about we take this meeting, get into the van, Go to Mandacati's in Queens, sit around, have some schiaffadoons, a glass of wine, we're all set. And Pete said, no, I'm happy with coffee. He goes, Pete, you fail to understand. <laughs> we are getting in that van, <laughs> and you're coming with us. Now, what Pete didn't tell us, and he should have, I guess, told us, was that um, he was an AA. And had he said that, it wouldn't have been an issue, but he didn't mention that. So we bring in the Mandacati's, and the guys are ordering about 800 bottles of wine. And he said, Pete, you gotta have a drink. And Pete goes, no, I don't care, come on. Anyway, by the end of the night, Pete is like hammered. And the poor guy, and Sonny said, you know, I can't have this guy around, he's a drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Sonny, he's an AA. He goes, what is that, the, the automobile car? <laughs> I said, no, alcoholics and animals. He goes, well, how do you know? I said, he told me. He says, so how's it about? I said, what well, you done? <laughs> so he said, you're going to take over because I, I, I don't trust him. He's, you know, he has one shot. He's like, you know. I said, well, I've never done this before. He goes, well, neither have I. And basically, and my wife is a witness to this. It, we ran for 13 weeks. It was probably, correct me if I'm wrong, the world's worst talk show. <laughs> The one fun thing, we, I, but we had a blast. I mean, I got to know a lot of cops, and someone at CBS, for whatever reason, saw this show, and called uh, Russell Jacobson and said, I'll put this show on, but rather than have the guys talk, and rather than use cops who are in their 80s, let's use young cops and, and have them tell their story, and then we recreate it. And that became Top Cops, which ran on CBS for five seasons. And Sonny put me in charge of that show. But the most fun we had, I actually was not going to take the job. I was offered a six-month gig at People Magazine that paid more than Sonny actually. Sonny's was very cheap. That Sonny actually was going to pay me. So I went to see Sonny, and I said, Sonny, listen, i got to take this People job because it pays much more than, uh, than what you're going to pay. He said, well, where is People? I said, 50th and 6th. He said, well, we're going to be at NBC. He said, and he said, there's an underground. <laughs> he said, what are you saying? He said, well, I know you're going to do it. Tell the boss at people, Jim Seymour, that you're going to do this job. And then everybody else dummies up. I said, well, they're going to know I'm missing. He said, moron, listen to me. <laughs> you get a hot cup of coffee, put it on your desk. You tape a note to the door. Be back in 10 minutes. <laughs> Nobody knows, right? More than that, that's, it worked out. He said, they're, they're drunk half the time that people think seen it, which they were at those days. <laughs> so I said, you think this will work? He said, hello. What's the deal? I said, I gotta do that for six months. He said, well, this show's gonna run, we had 13 episodes in nine weeks. 
I said, you see, he just got a job for nine weeks, he had two paychecks. He said, I did three jobs when I was doing the French Connection. I was tech advisor, I was writing books. I said, all right, fine, fine. So for, remember for nine weeks or whatever it was, I would run underground, leaving hot cups of coffee everywhere. And no one noticed I was missing, which was really kind of bizarre. But, but we got to NBC and I, was, I would sit behind the uh, Tribune grew that they really got to like me, but they held me responsible for anything that Sonny said. Anything, because he was capable of saying. I'll give you one quick example. We had a guy, a terrific cop, whose name I won't use, but he was, uh, what he would do is, he, he was a 10th degree black belt. He was a terrific cop, and he had his own dojo. So if he saw a kid like hit, about to go bad, he would take that kid, bring him in the dojo, train him, and over doing, doing this for a period of years, that kid, he helped put him into college and law school, who became a DEA agent, you became FBI, you went to uh, district attorney. He had connections all through the, street, uh, the city. He also had a group called the Night Fighters. If your block is troubled by crime, you would hire him. So we had him as a guest, and they thought, yeah, he could talk about the Night Fighters. So Sonny goes over to him and says, Johnny, so my block is infiltrated with criminals. I hire you and your gang. What do you do? So John, forgetting that he's on camera or not caring, <laughs> said, well, we, we go to the block that in question. We ascertain who the number one pusher of the drugs is, the, the top guy. And we take him upstairs to the roof and we toss him off the roof. <laughs> <laughs> the crowd goes wild. So he goes, yeah, you see how it works? Yeah. <laughs> Tribune grabs me, the head of Tribune goes, are you out of your mind? I said, I'll fix it. I go over, I whisper to Sonny, and said, we can't use this. He goes, well, it's a great story. I said, he just copped to a homicide. Oh, that's troubling. So he goes over, he whispers to John, and we had a judge on the show, Eddie Torres. Anybody know Eddie Torres? Yeah. Torres, great. He wrote Q&A. And Eddie's like advising John what to say, how to speak. No, you can't cop to that. And Eddie wrote Carlito's Way. And um, so anyway, um, take two is uh, we ascertain, uh, who the, you know, then he went into cop speak, you know, uh, the number one criminal, and we have a conversation with him. And eventually he sees that this is not productive for him to stay there, and he disappears. He goes in the wind. And I go, well, anything can happen when you're in the wind. You could live, you could die. <laughs> and John had to add, mostly die. <laughs> so, anyway, CBS asked us to put together this show, and the same week uh, the pilot uh, got picked up for CBS, I sold my first book to uh, Peter Gathers, 